came at a moment's notice uh, and helped out with that funeral. I wasn't expecting to be quite that involved, but it was very involved. And so uh, the ladies and Eddie, uh, uh, they, they were just awesome. They're just absolutely awesome. And I thank you for, for, for stepping up to the plate and, uh, and doing that. They have got an age limit now in the nursery. If you're over 60, you can't, was it, you can't be in the nursery or work in the nursery. <laughs> Amen. Glory to them. God. Now, 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 for the last, you know, it goes in spells. And, and uh, just before Bethany died, I think I did four funerals and several cancer patients. And then after Bethany, I did another cancer patient. Uh, I can't remember who the next one was, but then yesterday was another young lady. And so I've been. It's been a, I mean, there's been some that were that had some age on them. Of course, Sister Mary was the oldest, but uh, and uh, Sister Kathleen. But other than those two, everybody's been relatively young. Yesterday was 21, and so uh, the Lord just keeps speaking to me and saying, saying, praise me while you can. Praise me while you can. Work for me while you can. Do what you can do while. You can. And, and so, you know, uh, I love uh, our Brother Wayne in the very first year. His challenge was, and it was so cool, his challenge was this. Try to help give God. Amen? And isn't that cool? That's a cool challenge. Amen? Let me tell you this little story I heard first before I, I get to read. Get your Bible turn to Isaiah and hold on to it for a minute. Isaiah uh, 54. Now, now, a little boy came home. Uh, it was actually Daniel. Yeah. DC, please tell him I told this on him. Please. Daniel came home and left from the playground with a bloody nose and a black eye and torn clothing. And it was obviously it'd been a bad, a bad fight and lost. While I was patching him up, I asked him, so what happened? He said, well, Dad, uh, Daniel said, I challenged Larry to a duel. And, then, and you know, I gave him his choice of weapons. I said, uh-huh, so that seems fair. He said, yeah, but I never thought he would choose his big sister. <laughs> 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 Amen. We're going to talk today on something very powerful. Uh, this is part one of the two-parter, and and uh, it just keeps amazing me. I just keep seeing this thing. I keep hearing it. Yesterday, it even sprang out even more. Uh, the, the more funerals I do, and the more I see young people uh, going out of here too, it just it just lets me know that death is no respecter of persons, and and so. Uh, it's very important that while I'm here, I'm going to praise Him. While I'm here on this earth, I'm going to do for Him. While I'm here on this earth, I'm going to take that challenge. I'm going to try my best to outgive God. But not only am I going to try my best to outgive God, I'm going to add to that challenge. Try to outdo God. Y'all got real quiet. Yeah, because I don't know how you can't. How do you outdo God? You can't. You can't outgive Him and you can't outdo Him. I didn't say do it. I said try. Okay, y'all hear that? Try. Try to outgive God, try to outdo God. I guarantee you won't, but what you will do is as you're trying to outdo Him, what He's going to do is show you that you can't because He's going to be even stronger and even more powerful in your life. Amen. So that's what we're talking about today is getting stronger and more powerful uh, in our life. And so today, it's, it's just a simple question. And I want you to listen. It's very important. Here it is. Are you dreaming big enough? Don't answer that right now. Are you dreaming big enough? Stand for the reading of the word. Isaiah chapter 54. Let's just go to verse 1 and we'll stop at verse 2. Oh, we're just going to do three verses here. I'm not even sure half time. How many verses we want to do? Ready? Verse 1, Isaiah 54, verse 1. Sing, O barren, that thou didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, that thou didst not travail a child. For more the children are desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. In other words, there's been some bad times, but you get ready because something good is going to come if you trust Him. you got to trust Him. Amen? you gotta, you got to get off the wishbone and get some backbone. Amen? you got to trade in your wishbone for a backbone. Look at somebody and tell them, trade in your wishbone for a backbone. Amen. It's time to get busy for God. Amen. Watch this. Enlarge the place of thy tent 
And then he'll stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations, spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. He's talking about, listen, your tent, where your tent's at now, what you're doing now, what you're inhabiting now, what's going on in your life now, you need to get ready for expansion. Get ready for God to do something in your life so big that you're going to have to expand the cords. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to, to, to really bear down on the stakes because what God wants to do in our lives, He may not have done it before. He says, but guess what? Those that have seen to have loss in their life, your children are going to be greater than those that were, that were pregnant with children all the time. What He's trying to say is, listen, get ready for increase. So my question is, is your dream too small? For thou shalt break forth from the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. But stretch forth your hands this way. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, you're alive and well, and I know you're standing beside, you're standing beside your Father on the throne. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch us, Lord, to encourage us, Lord, help us to see, Lord, that time is short. And, Father, that we have to get busy doing what you've called us to do. Lord, I like that challenge. Try to outgive God. And I like the, the, the second part of that challenge. Try to outdo God because you can't do either one. But, praise God, as we try, then as one of those is it increases our faith. And as it increases our faith in our stewardship, then as we're increased, then the response coming back is way increased. And I thank you for that. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to touch us, to help us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said Amen. Amen. Tell somebody the past is behind us. The future is ahead of us. God is with us. And nothing shall be impossible. And nothing shall be impossible. Now, now let me just talk to you. I'm not going to talk to you for a long time today, hopefully. You know, I'm going to be like D.C. when he says, let's see if y'all can hold that. My little, my little D.C. DC always tells me, Daddy, you haven't played till your fingers hurt. D.C., I played today, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. When your fingers when your fingers start hurting, you know you've been playing. Amen. So, so, uh, so here we go. Watch this. I got the question of the hour. I'm not going to ask y'all to list questions. Y'all will list them. Oh, coming up in the next few weeks, we're going to put it in the bulletin. We're going to have a concrete date set. And when the concrete date is set, I may even just put up a sign-up sheet out back uh, so we can kind of get a count of how much stuff to get going. But in a few weeks, we're going to do. Uh, uh, Work, or we're going to have an eight-week course on defeating depression and/or uh, uh, defeating things that's got you defeated in your life. So, so it's going to be an eight course. It's going to be a Tuesday night, eight-week course on Tuesday nights. It's going to be free. If you know somebody in your life that's, that's, that's having problems with depression and/or defeat, bring them. Uh, this this is it's, it's, uh, it's actually called mindfulness cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, Christian with the Christian viewpoint, but still, I don't have to tell about all that. Just say, look, you got a problem? Come on up here. We got something good going. You got some chronic, a chronic something in your life? Come on up and trust God to do something special for you. So that, that's coming up, and also uh, we're getting ready to start over across the street uh, some, some something called free, which is freeing people from from uh, or helping them stay free from alcohol and drugs and things that are addicting. It's going to be for the addicts and the families. So, so it's going to be both. So it's not going to be just for one. It's going to be for both. Some of it's going to be together. Some of it's going to be separate. But that's okay. And, and it's going to be a great, great thing. Amen? Amen. Y'all need to be telling people about this and act excited about it. Amen. Okay? you got to act, act excited about it because I'll tell you what. If you're telling me, y'all come to the party tonight. <laughs> We're going to have a good time. I ain't going to your party. <laughs> I'm going to sleep at home. Amen. <laughs> Okay, you ready? Watch. Question. Ready? What is the biggest enemy of the church? Don't answer yet. What is the biggest enemy of your family? <clears throat> We're going to get deeper now. What is the biggest enemy of your marriage? What is the biggest... <laughs> What is the, I like that. I heard somebody say, that's the biggest enemy of your marriage. Somebody said to me, I don't know who that was, although I think I did, I won't say that. <laughs> what is the biggest enemy at your work? Ready? Get ready. I would ask y'all to give me some stuff, but I don't need no advice. I want you to just listen, okay? Some of you would say Satan. 
some even say the world. And although they are enemies of the church, although they're enemies of your family, although they're enemies of your marriage, although they're enemies at your work, that is not the biggest enemy you face every day. You know what the biggest enemy is? Get ready. Mediocrity. Just let me get by. Just let me do what I need to do to satisfy my wife and do what I need to do to satisfy my boss and do what I need to do to satisfy God. Just let me get by. God, just leave me alone. Let me do whatever I can do just to get by. And I sometimes only care if I get by. Just I'm going to do something. Nobody's ever said that, have you? Nobody's ever felt that, have you? And, and, and watch, Satan and the world will take that attitude and run rampant. He'll take that attitude and he will destroy your family, your marriage, your work ethic. He will destroy the church. If everybody just sits around and says, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else take care of it. Let somebody, I don't have to. I just need to get by. Now listen, listen carefully. We're sitting down here right now. I think I got a little, I think I got a little head of me there. There's excellence and there's mediocrity. Watch this now. The choice is ours. Mediocrity means medium, to get by. Think about it now, to get by. To be excellent means to excel, to go beyond. So now, Israel here, that's what happened. Israel's in a place right now that's in a very tough, tough place. God called Israel to excel because he was going to bring his son into the world to deliver the whole world from sin and he was going to use Israel to do it. So he had to have a, a special people, a special called people, people of excellence to bring forth his son. What happened is, over the years, they chose instead of to excel or go beyond, they chose to get by. Listen carefully. Think about your own choices you've made in the last couple of years. The last couple of months, the last couple of weeks, the last couple of days, the last couple of hours. Think about the choices that you've made. Have it been to excel, to go beyond, or has it been medium just to get by? When you have the mediocre spirit, you have to blame somebody else for you being the way you are. But when you stand before God, God doesn't take that. When you stand before God, God doesn't say, well, you know, I know that you didn't do the best you could, but I understand it was his fault, it was their fault. They all kept you from doing what you were supposed to be doing. That's not what he's going to say. He's going to put it down there, and instead of saying all these people is their fault, he's going to say, you held your own self-ransom to a mediocre spirit. You just wanted to get by. You just wanted to do what you had to do. And then hear how it is. We want God to work for us at 110%. And at times, we want to give him 10. And wonder what's going on in our life. So watch this. Watch. Watch this happen. They lost their freedom because of a mediocre spirit. But they did not lose God's grace. Wow, that's powerful. I thank God he don't kill me every time I mess up. Amen. If he buzzed me every time I messed up, good Lord, I'd be going to look like I have been fried. God doesn't do that. God has an amazing grace. And so because of that grace, look, you've got a choice. You can choose excellence or you can choose mediocrity. Now, now watch this. you got to understand this now. God is fixing broken pieces of your life. He wants to. And in the process of getting beyond mediocrity, God will heal the broken pieces of your life. Here's Grace talking. Some of these guys are going into captivity. Some of these guys are coming out of captivity. But anyway, about it, he's talking to them. And he tells them, see, see, that this is an extreme time in their history. Some are, are, are just going in. Some are get, just finding out what change we're all about. 
Some will find out what it was like they had to change off their hands. But anyway, I buy they were a broken people. And so, in the middle of them being broken, some going into chains, some are coming out of chains, guess what? In the middle of all that, in the middle of extreme hurt and pain, God says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Wow. You know, there was this uh, salesman had come in. It was, on a, it, was, it was going to this, uh, uh, this farm center. And it was just a little old mom and pop farm center place. And so he goes in. And a guy comes in. He says, I need to buy some fence posts and some fencing on credit. And the guy said, uh, are you fencing in or fencing out? He said, I'm fencing in. He said, you can't have it. The next guy came in and said, I want to buy some fence posts and some fencing. And he said, are you fencing in or fencing out? He said, I'm fencing out. He said, you can have all you want. When he walked away, the salesman looked over at the other store and said, can you tell me something? Why did you tell one guy they asked for the same thing? They asked for the same thing. And you told one yes and one no. He said, well, you're listening. He said, I asked him, are they fencing in or fencing out? He said, well, what about that? He said, if they're fencing in, it means they're closing in. It means they're, they're folding up. They're, they're, they're not expecting growth. Matter of fact, they're expecting to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So they're fencing in. And he says, I'm not going to give credit to somebody fencing in because more than likely they'll never pay me back. He said, but the other guy was fencing out, meaning he was expecting growth. He was doing things to cause his farm to grow. And he says, I know that he's going to need more and more and more. The other guy's going to need less and less and less. He's going to need more and more and more. And my question to us today, all of us, are we fencing in for God or are we fencing out? Just stop for a second and think about it. Are you fencing in or fencing out? Why? Are you expecting God to grow stuff in your life and to get on with it and go for it? Or are you expecting just to get by, get me out of here, let me go home and cover my head? Some folks, honestly, I think have a groundhog mentality. When they see their shadow, they run and hide. And God says, I don't want you fencing in. I want you fencing out. He's talking to people that are hurting. He's talking to people that have been in, in poverty. He's talking to people that have been impoverished. They've been in chains. They have been hurting. Their lives have been torn to pieces. And God says, in the middle of all that pain, I want you to start fencing out. Because when you fence out, I'm going to pour in more than you ever could imagine. But it's got to start somewhere. And where does it start? Take your finger and do that. So let me ask you a question again. Are you fencing in for God? Or are you fencing out? That's a big question. Are you going to try to outgive him and outdo him? Or are you going to sit back and say, God, I'll be happy if I get my little bitty mansion on the hillside. I used to hate. So I said, can we have a testimony service preacher? And we have a testimony service. I used to hate it because somebody without doubt would get up and go. I mean, we're testifying about God's power and God's grace and what God's done. They go, I gotta tell it, preacher, I gotta tell it. And I let them up, they tell all this story and it's magnificent. And we're, we're, we're just shouting to God. And all of a sudden somebody stands up and says, in the testimony service, y'all pray for me. The devil's been on my back all week. I don't know if I'm ever gonna make it. Y'all pray. That maybe, by the grace of God, I'll get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> huh? That does not get me excited. That does not get me riled up. The difference is the person that was fencing out was talking about how great God is. The person that was fencing in says, help me make it in by the skin of my teeth. So I said, watch this now. So I said, I'm almost through. I told you this is just this is just the start. I've only got 20 more pages. Y'all get ready. <laughs> watch this now. This is so, so awesome. 
Those that were going in, those that were coming out, they all got the same challenge because grace calls to everyone. Y'all say that. Grace is calling to everyone. Say it again. Grace is calling to everyone. Amen. So now, now watch this. this. This is so awesome. In order for us to have God put back the broken pieces in our life, in order for us to fence out not fence in, then we're going to have to enlarge our view of God. I've noticed in the last few years, I've noticed a lot of people over the years. We're not talking about in this church. I'm talking about period. I've noticed a lot of people fencing in and fencing in and fencing in. And, and honestly, it, it just, I see it so much now that it's honestly, it just got now where it just drives me up the wall when I see somebody fencing in for God. Because that's not bringing Him glory. That's not bringing growth to you. That's not showing what God can do. We have to fence out. Amen? So I see this. Here, here you watch it now. Watch, watch. We, we can, we can, we can sit back and wallow in defeat, or we can, we can, we can watch what God can do. Watch this. Everything about this verse speaks of increase. Remember, He's talking to people in change, and in the change, He's telling things that don't even make sense. I, I don't understand, God. My hands are going to change, and You're telling me to get ready for increase. You're telling me you're going to do something special in my life. Well, I think that's pretty cool when you think about Jesus coming from the, from, from the tribe of Judah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, God's getting ready to do something. So, so watch. Nothing that encourages us in this verse to maintain status quo, but to enlarge our perspective of God. It's got to start here before you can see it here. Come on. It's got to start here before you can see it here. So, so, so here we are. I told you, not, not much more to go. We're going to be out of here. But that's why I say amen. <laughs> Some people see God as limiting and controlling. You know, like, like, like uh, has anybody ever, when they were little boys, had magnifying glasses and they went outside and magnified grass and caught a little fire? And they magnified other things, rocks and hell and burnt their finger and even done their own finger and hurt and, some of the mean guys, I wasn't one of them. They even did ants and stuff. Remember that? Sometimes we look at God as if God's got a big magnifying glass and he's holding it down on us. And he's going, I'm going to get you. You can move all you want, but I'm bigger than you and I'm going to get you. I'm just going to keep magnifying things around you and I'm going to burn you up. You watch. That's not the God we serve. It can be no further from the truth. The God we serve is waiting. He is waiting for us to gleam the power of His Spirit and gleam and think about what God is calling us to do. Now, let me, let me ask you something. Get ready. There goes another one. I'm telling you, say, well, here, some, well somebody put a bird on his saddle. No, no I, just, I, I just keep going to these funerals, and these funerals have got me, you know, it's done something to me. If you keep doing funerals, Old, 90, how old? 95, 96, 295, and 96. Yeah, but all these young people have just been getting to me. Like yesterday, 21 year old, you know, we got to get busy. We got to do something. We got to stand up, quit fixing in, start fixing out. It's important. When we do that thing over there for the, the drug addicts, that's fixing out. When we have this over here for, for the eight week course, that's fixing out. Whatever we need to do, we need to start thinking about it. Are we fencing in or are we fencing out? Are we trying to hold our own or are we trying to take new ground? Amen? Think about that in your own life. Think about that in your marriage. Think about that in your family. Think about that in your work. Am I trying to hold our ground or am I trying to take new ground? Amen? So, so, so again, God's in this. Now, watch this. I love this. A person who fails and gets back up is much stronger than a person who never fails. Who saw the mighty army this morning? The strongest people are the ones that did not have an easy life. Greatest leaders. If you look at our greatest leaders, the top 100 leaders in the world in the last century, the very top of a bunch of them, every last one of them had to come over overwhelming uh, odds to even think about being in the position they were to become the leader that they were. Uh, so, so, so again, just because you've fallen does not mean that everything's bad. You may have fallen, but when you get back up, you were stronger than the person that never fell at all. Amen? I'm going to say another hint, too. Don't, don't, don't try to find out where you failed. If you want to try to keep doing it again, don't find out where you fell. Find out where you tripped. Come on. If you want to find out if you've fallen again, don't look where you failed, look where you tripped. Because the trip is what's going to be the thing that causes it. 
So watch this now. Here we go. Watch this. Look, here, here's my question. Ready? If y'all throw fruit, make sure it's real fruit, not canned fruit. Ready? Uh, why do you come to church? Don't answer. This is one of those rhetorical questions. Why do you come to church? Next question. When you see people running, you're praising God and praise and worship. Do you participate or spectate? Not everybody participates the same way. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about inside. Inside. After praise and worship, are you listening to the sermon to glean from it? Or are you saying, will he please hurry up so I can go? I promise you that if you couldn't answer that first question while I come to church, there's already a problem. If it's just to keep my wife happy, or it's just to do whatever, to whatever, you know, I just want to keep having troubles here or there, and I'm just trying to make somebody feel okay. No, why do you come? Also, in praise and worship, if you watch others, but you choose not to participate, I'm not talking about an hour show, hour show, people do it different. Some raise their hands, some don't. You know, I, I remember, I remember first got to Church of God, we first got a good old dose of, good old dose of Holy Ghost. I remember D.C. and Daniel's mother, but she would look like a sprinkler hose. The spirit would get on her, and she would just go back and forth. You could feel the glory, and she went back and forth. The spirit would hit me, and I looked like a water hose with the ink on it. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not how you do it, but I'm asking inside. And praise and worship's going on. Do you really praise? Or are you just sitting inside? Well, glad when this gets over. And it doesn't have to be me preaching. Whoever's preaching. Are you waiting for the sermon to get over? So you can get out of here? Are you making your shopping list that you're going to do when you leave here? Or are you gleaming while God is speaking in the hour? I saw such an amazing thing the other night. I know some of y'all are not Duke fans, and that's okay. God will forgive you. <laughs> but the other night, Duke was behind 23 points with 10 minutes to go. They had played like they weren't even playing against Louisville. I looked over at Linda, and I said, you know what? I wish they had not been talking about how great they were. Not them, but the reporters were talking about how great they were when they beat Virginia twice and, and how they were going to be unbeatable and all this stuff. I said, every time somebody starts bragging on them, they do this. And so here they are down 23 points. And Coach K, watch this, called him in. And he spoke to him. <laughs> I don't know I said. I remember I was doing that one time. We were getting whooped so bad. And I called a timeout and I brought all the guys in and said, <laughs> what's going on, Coach? I said, y'all getting beat. I said, okay, what do we do? I said, play! Coach Kay said something to them. <clears throat> and then they went out and in 10 minutes made 25 points. Beat Louisville, shut them down. It was amazing to watch. Even if I wasn't a Duke fan, that would have been amazing to watch. Even if I was a Louisville fan, that would have been amazing to watch. After the game, one of the players got up, Williamson, and said, what did the coach say to y'all? I love it. He said, he pulled him in and said, fellas, I don't coach losers. You get out there and do what you know you can do. And then he said, before they went out, I said, hold on. He says, if you start losing confidence, I want you to look at me. Wow. And he stood there like a rock. And 
he called, he called his guys, he, 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 just kept, he just kept edging them on, edging them on. 20, 25 points in 10 minutes. Good Lord, have mercy. But you know what? All I could hear was the Holy Ghost speaking in me. Look, look, I didn't call you to lose. I'm not calling you to lay down. I'm not calling you to play dead. I called you to get out and win. And I can hear it again. Look, again, hear the Holy Spirit say, when you don't think you can handle it, and you start losing your confidence, turn back and look at the cross. You're going to win. Amen. That's right. The same thing with you right now. Look at the cross. Keep your eye on Jesus. God's got this. Sit down. Sit down. Watch this. Get ready. Y'all should have been jumping right about then. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Watch this. John 10 and 10. The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There's two, two heavy words there. The thief cometh and says, and I am come that they might. The thief cometh to, he says, I'm coming that they might. Two different things. When the thief comes, he doesn't ask permission. When the thief comes, he doesn't care who he hurts. When the thief comes, it's a very powerful powerful thing. And so, a lot of times we, we, we get that first part and you know, watch this. The, too many lines of that first part, the thief coming up, the skill still and destroy. The reason is because he doesn't ask permission. He doesn't care if he hurts you. Matter of fact, the more you hurt, the better he feels. But that second part, he says, that I am come that they might have life. That they might have life. Meaning, decision is yours. Jesus already made a way. But the decision is yours. Are you going to realize that God hasn't called you to lose? That God hasn't called you to, to, to sit on the bench? You know, it's one thing I can always say and I always, even to this day, I'm so, I'm so tickled and, and glad that I did. And I've had my players come back to me later and tell me how much it meant to them is the only time I used the bench was for discipline. I let every player play. Every player play. Every player play. And I used the bench for discipline. And there's only one in here that ever had to sit on the bench for discipline. I'm not going to mention his name. But it's that tall guy in the very back. <laughs> and it was only one game one of DC. Just once. All it took. DC kept saying, Daddy, will you please put me on the bench? I'm tired. I said, son, I need you out there. I need you. He said, Daddy, I'm so tired. Put me on the bench. I said, DC, no. Then when I finally called him in, he got so excited. Watch this. Listen. And I'm here, I'm here to blow you away with something. Ephesians 3.20, and this is going to be, be in the closing until <laughs> next week. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do more than we ever could think or imagine. I want you to think about the hardest thing in your life right now. I mean, it seems graveyard dead. It's not going to change. Put that up front. And you quit trying to fix it and give it to God. I looked at that family yesterday, and I hated it, Lord knows. I remember not long ago, I was sitting out there with Bethany. Uh, Bethany's urn was up here, and yesterday, the 21-year-old's urn's up there, and and all I can look down until they get the mother and father and say, you know, you want to fix it, but you can't. You can't fix this. But you can give it to God. And he can make something out of this. There's so many things in our life we can't fix. But instead of fencing in, keep on fencing out and know that God has got this and God can fix this. He can, not us. He can. So, 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 now watch this. Here it is. How many has ever, oh look, look at this, God's preparing us for greater things. I have not seen or ear heard or imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Get ready. Get ready. Ready? How many thinks that, all, that always is talking about heaven? Can we talk about, about heaven a lot? Don't we? When Paul's talking about this, he's not talking about heaven. He's talking about now. Wow. I told you, you're going to shake some theology. All you can think about is what's going on in heaven. And I know good and well in heaven is awesome. Man, it's awesome. But right now, now, I have not seen, ear has 
not heard, no mind has imagined why God is prepared for us now. We love Him. You see, look, Paul's not talking about heaven in this passage. Watch she is. God's, all throughout the Bible, God has called His people to expand and stretch, to believe in more. Do you know a rubber band is useless until it's stretched? What you call a boomerang that won't come back to you? A stick. <laughs> when you put that curve in it, it goes under that tension and under that pressure, it can become a deadly weapon. Some of us are under that pressure right now and don't realize that God is making us into a deadly weapon. We feel the burning and we feel the itching and we feel the, the terror and we feel the pain. And we're going, God, are you going to keep on doing this? Because I can't stand a minute much more of this. And God's saying, just hold on. You don't understand now, but I'm making you a deadly weapon. And you don't understand it. Later on, I'm going to use you to do something that you never imagined that you could do. But you've got to trust me. And remember, a rubber band's no good until it's stretched. How many of you ever put a, a bag of rubber bands? You need one rubber band, so you go to Walmart and you buy a whole bag. Or to the dollar store, wherever. You put them in the drawer. A year or two later, you need a rubber band. So you go back and say, oh, that's right, I got them in this drawer. I had them there just a little while ago. And you go in that drawer that's been hot and cold for two years. You pick it out and you, you start winding around something. What does it do? It breaks. Why does it break? Because it was held inactive for two years. Two questions. Number one, do you want to break? When you stretch, do you want to break? Or when you stretch, do you want to break? My daddy used to be working in the meat market. He got this great old big rubber band. So things were like this. And does anybody work with Joey Roberts anymore? I'm going to tell him. Me and Joy Roberts would get up on the, in, in the school on the second floor, and he had those little slack rubber bands, those bitty ones. We'd take popsicle sticks or sucker sticks and bend them over or take, make a big old thing of paper, and we'd like to pop people on top of the head. <laughs> and they went by and then hide. <laughs> when Joy did, they thought a, 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 a bird just flew by. <laughs> when they had that great little big one, I pulled that thing back. I let it go. Y'all don't think I would do that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, my mama said I was the toughest one of the bunch. And I used to get a big old shot of joy out here and pop! <laughs> Stretch me, God. Stretch me. Stretch me. God, stretch me. Somebody said it to me. God stretch me. Say it. God stretch me. God stretch me. God stretch me. God stretch me. I was watching how they built arrows and bows the other night. And I saw the bow that were building. They had to take that bow and the way for that bow to work the best, the way for the bow to work the best was to go against the grain. Go against everything. Everything that it was trying to do, go against it and pull against it. And pull against it. And said, that's where it's got the strength from. The stuff that was against it was the stuff that made it the strongest. Whoa. Whoa. So here we go. I'm getting ready really close. DC, get ready to play something. Here we go. You can't even imagine. It's not even crossed our minds what God can do for us if we would just trust Him. God will open the doors. Come on, DC. God will open the doors. We've got to walk through. God will uh, straighten the path, but we have to walk. God will strengthen and protect us, but we have to face our fears. Let God do something fresh in our life. I want you to think about this for next week. Are you fencing in or fencing out? Are you expecting God to do greater things in your life or do you think it's all over? Brother Billy really touched my heart the other night. He's in the nursing home and he can't even walk right now. He's in 
friend that's broken. If y'all get a chance to go see him, please go see him. He's in rehab right now, but he can't walk. And he got talking about Bethany. Here's a 91-year-old man. And he says, I know it's rough trying to drive around without your partner. I said, oh, yeah, it is. I keep missing places and I keep missing appointments because she was there as my handler. She kept me going. She was my, my GPS and my handler. I said, it just hurts that she's not with me all the time. I was with 24-7. Brother Billy at 91 years old. Didn't say there, there. He said, well, I'll tell you what. When I get out of here, whenever you go somewhere, you just come by my house and pick me up. He said, I'll go with you. 91. 91. He said, I'll be right with you, brother. We'll go. We'll, we'll, we'll tear it loose. We'll go. And I, I thought about that thing. in the 
name of Jesus. We thank you. Also, while we're praying, you go up your eyes now. While we're praying, remember, Sister Dorothy has pneumonia. She's in Buffalo County Hospital. Brother Billy can't walk. He's in Grantsbrook. Uh, uh, Melissa and Jason, some of y'all remember them? That's their daughter, 21 years old, Sarah. Uh, she died, and they had her funeral yesterday. And uh, remember that family, because I know they're hurt. There's so much that we can be doing to make ourselves available and busy to do. Stretch, stretch, stretch. God's calling us to stretch, to stretch. Now, if anybody has a special need you want to be praying for, you can come on up now. That's fine. I don't want to end it with, without anybody having a chance to pray. If you want to come up, you can. I think it's about to say God's got this. God's got Stretch. Y'all say it. Stretch. Stretch. When DC and Daniel were little, they loved that stretch arm strong. We get that thing out, we pull those arms. You remember stretch arm strong? We pull those arms out, we get ourselves where we can pull them and bend them all around. You know, I want to be a spiritual stretch arm strong. Amen. It's time to grow. Look at somebody say, do I see it? Say, ready, set, grow. Ready, set, grow. Say it again. Ready, set, grow. <laughs> Amen. All right. Tuesday night, uh, we, we, I'm not sure exactly what we're doing this Tuesday night because we, we really had a great time last Tuesday night. Though. But still, up in about several weeks coming up, we're going to have it uh, with this on, on, on depression and defeat. And it's going to be awesome. And coming up soon, we're going to be over there. Uh, and I'm going to need people, people that's, that, that's got experience in this, that's had some problems with this, uh, to, to come and help with, with either with the, the people that come that are are addicted or with the people that are with the, fa the family, the caregivers. It'll be awesome. Amen? Brother Baker, the elder brother Baker. Amen. The one driving the bus right now. The pilot, the co-pilot's behind him, all right? <laughs> Let's miss us in prayer, brother.